All right, guys, we are at the North East Texas Rural Heritage Museum, and it's housed in the old Cotton Belt Depot here in Pittsburgh, Texas. There's some information on it. And we've got another historical marker here. You can pause this if you want to read it about a shootout that took place here right on this location and this was a working train depot until 1968 now it's a museum so let's go in and check it out hey guys before we get started on the tour of uh, this museum I wanted to preface something with you one of the big attractions to this museum is the Ezekiel airship which I thought was the first airplane or aircraft to actually fly. Well, it turns out that it did fly before the Wright brothers ever got their plane up off the ground. But in order to make it official, at that time you had to either have film footage documenting that it flew or some other good type of uh, documentation proving that you had actually lifted off the ground. Now the Ezekiel airship that you'll see in this video did actually fly for about 150 feet but there was only three or four spectators there that actually witnessed it. So I was under the impression that that makes it the first plane that actually flew. Not officially. What makes it official is the documentation. So there was actually several planes or aircraft that flew before the Wright brothers, but they were the first ones that had the actual documentation of theirs flying. So having said that, enjoy the video. All right, guys, we're inside the museum. And this is the star attraction here. This is the Ezekiel airship. This is a reproduction of the original. And this contraption flew in 1902, almost a year before the Wright brothers were able to fly. And some interesting things about this ship, if you look closely, there's actually two sets of what looks like wheels on each side. Actually, there's four of them, but um, the outer wheel spins forward and the inner wheel spins backward where the paddles are to create lift. Unfortunately, the original was damaged beyond repair during transport. And this airship flew 10 to 12 feet off the ground for about 150 feet and then it had a vibration and the pilot became scared of the stabilization of the aircraft and shut the engine off and it crash landed damaged the airship he had it rebuilt and then it was damaged during transport and the city of pittsburgh decided to recreate it and built this exact replica of it but this was the first, I guess you'd say airplane, that ever flew. Doesn't look like any airplane I've ever seen, does it? No. And from what we understand, it flew more like a helicopter than a plane. It's amazing. It is. Ezekiel. It was like named the after the the book of Ezekiel. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And from what we understand, the the man who built this was a Baptist minister, Earl and Cannon. Earl Earl Cannon. Burl. Burl. Burl Cannon, and he designed this based on the description from the book of Ezekiel. It's amazing. Wow. And 
there's a bunch of information on it. Thank you, Mr. And this is an original photograph from 1898 of the airship. Wow, what an imagination. And the local residents of Pittsburgh here were the ones that financed the building of the original airship. And the museum here added this entire annex on just so they could display this once the city had built the exact replica. This is what it looked like when it flew. There were some kids on a fence post that were witnesses and a few other bystanders when it actually flew. Tell you about the motor. Okay. okay. Uh, we don't know what kind of motor he had in his, in his thing. And all of the descriptions and writings and things talk about a gas engine. So the, when they did the, remade it, they put this thing in there for an engine with those cylinders. But my own personal opinion, what they used, what Burrow Cannon used, was a modified automotive engine and the gas was gasoline. Oh wow. Because that's what everybody was using. Mm -hmm. and that was experimenting with flight at that time. Wow. Boy, the pilot didn't have a very good view. No. That's amazing. Pretty much you're stuck with looking straight ahead. Yeah. <laughs> So in East Texas, they claim they had the first airship that ever flew. Okay. Uh, actually, the first airship that ever flew was the Wright brothers. There were people that flew an airship before that, but it was not repeated, or it was not controlled, or it was not documented. Okay. So, you know, that's really not having flown. Yeah. The Wright brothers were the first ones. And I'm sure there were people before Burrow Cannon that flew. We, we don't claim that he was the first one to fly. Okay. But he was unique. I yeah. Mean, you ever see an airship that looked like this? No, not at all. It looks like a big parachute. Yeah. It looks like something from a Jules Verne novel. Yeah. A uh, thing from this little town of Pittsburgh. Po a population of about 5,000. We had a guy flying an airplane. We also had <coughs> Carol Shelby. Uh, if Carol Shelby was an automotive engineer, race car driver, uh, and he worked for Ford Motor Company in Detroit, and they made a movie about him called Ford versus Ferrari mm -hmm. a couple, three years ago, and that Matt Damon played his part in the movie. Aww. And this, when, okay, first of all, Carol Shelby is not from Pittsburgh. He's from a little town called Leesburg, which is about six miles down the road. And when he finished with his life of celebrity, he came back to this area. And we have a college out here, Northeast Texas Community College. And it has an automotive program called the Carol Shelby Automotive Program. So Carol Shelby donated this car to the college and it's very valuable because it was the last Shelby automobile that he actually ever purchased himself because he died shortly after he donated this car to the university. Wow. That's gorgeous. Isn't it? They don't make cars that look nice anymore. They all look the same. No joke. You're right. Look at that. Wow. Now, I had a gentleman come in one day from Leesburg and he asked me if I could name two famous people from Leesburg. And of course, after Carol Shelby, I mean, who are you gonna name? It's just a little crossroad town. 
And the other one was J.D. Tippett. J.D. Okay. Tippett was the Dallas police officer who shot and killed Lady Harvey Oswald. Yeah, yeah we, we, did, we did a video on J.D. Tippett. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We went we to know. his grave site. Yeah. I think the Tippetts and the Shelbys uh, live still around the Leesburg area. Small world, it is. It is. That, that Mustang is gorgeous. Man. Now, people who are knowledgeable about things, and it is not me, have told me that the greatest car chase in movie history was in the movie Bullet with Steve McQueen, mm -hmm. and he drove a 1968 Shelby Mustang. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, a Mustang. It was not a Shelby Mustang, it was a Cobra. Yeah. But it's a 1968 Mustang, yep. and I think it was the same color. Yeah, yeah it was. It was. Yeah. <laughs> now, another interesting thing about Pittsburgh is, is a 1925 Model T Ford, and <clears throat> it was uh, been customized, of course, but the mayor drove this in parades here in town, and the mayor was Mayor Abernathy, and he was the mayor here for... 52 years, wow. which I understand is the record for longest period of time as a mayor. Wow. And after he got out of office, there was another guy that was mayor, at least for one term, and now Abernathy's son is the mayor. So we have another Mayor Abernathy in this oh. world. And the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah. <laughs> That is neat. Yeah, it is. That's very cool. Now, of course, this man, uh, cutout here represents Bo Pilgrim. Yes. And he used to actually wear a Pilgrim hat and take a chicken around with him when he gave speeches. And the chicken was Henrietta. Henrietta. And when Henrietta retired, she came to the museum. That is Henrietta. Oh, oh. my goodness. Oh my goodness. Look at one of his hats too. Now there used to be statues, right? And they're, are they been taken down? They had, well, okay. When you're going north out of Pittsburgh on 271, you go by where they have the processing plant and stuff for Pilgrim. Oh, okay. And they used to have the Pilgrim's headquarters there. And when Bo, oh I don't know about three, four years ago, sold the company, to another company out of Brazil, I think. Yes, it's a And they big... moved all of the uh, office personnel to Denver. But the worker bees are still here. And okay. the worker bees are what, you know, give everybody in Pittsburgh a job. They used to have a big head of Bo Pilgrim, you know, at the... looking like a pilgrim, mm -hmm. uh, at the processing plant right next to the highway. And they, they took it down. And when they took it down, I said, oh, please don't give it to us. Please don't give it to us. Because where are we going to put a great big head of mm -hmm. old Pilgrim? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what happened to it. It's probably in a warehouse somewhere. Wow. That. Barbara and Conrad is from here. Uh, they she wore this dress when she appeared employees. at the Lincoln Center concert. The biggest poultry producer in the world. From a little bitty town of Pittsburgh, it's just hard to believe. And of course, we've got Barbara some critters Conrad here. Was an opera singer from Pittsburgh, and that gown in there, she wore that at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. Wow. And this fire engine uh, we got from Dallas, it's a 1925 French built fire engine. And it has a chain and sprocket transmission, which is kind of unusual. Wow. Oh, that's huge. And this is what it looked like when we got it. And the local fire department volunteered to restore it. And as you can see, they did an absolutely fantastic job. Yeah. They uh, used to run in some parades here in town, but after they moved it in the museum, too big a hassle getting it in and out. But as far as I know, it still runs. Wow. Now, when they were restoring this, they no longer made the tires the right size. And as I understand it, 
Goodyear customized these tires for us. Wow. wow. Look at the detail. Yeah. Yeah, they did a really great job on it. They're really nice. The bell still works. When little kids come in here, I let them <laughs> ring the bell, and they get a big charge. I ring the bell on the fire engine. Yeah, I'm not sits outside. To do that, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is what the vehicle looked like before restoration. We've got all kinds of relics. It's an old switchboard. Okay. Collection of old telephones. Now the outdoors, we got a lot of lakes and stuff around here. You probably are aware. Of. But I always like to tell a story about outdoor motors. At this point. A couple of guys took their girlfriends out to a lake for a picnic on a hot day and across the lake you could see this place that was selling soda pop and ice cream. So one of the gals said, you know, it would really be nice to get ice cream on a hot day like this. So the guy jumped in their boat, rode across, got the ice cream, rode back. By the time they got back, the ice cream had melted. And the one guy said, you know, there should be a better way. There should be a, a portable motor for a rowboat, and his name was Ollie Avonrude, and in 1911 he got the patent for the first practical outboard motor which looked like this. Wow. wow. And that is a true story. So next time you're out in a motorboat, just remember that it's only possible because some gal wanted ice cream on a hot day. That's for me. <laughs> and her name was Bess, and she married Ollie, and they lived happily ever after. Oh. Wow. A see-through gas pump. Is this the one like John has, Greg? A Ferguson? Is it, his is a Macy. Macy Ferguson, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It looks better than John's. Yeah, it does. <laughs> in better shape. Yeah. yeah. Now, these are some things that were in a would have been in a farmhouse around the turn of the century, around 1900, mm -hmm. except for this thing back here called a fireless cooker. And what they do is put heated stones in one side, food in the other, close it up. And I don't know if it was supposed to uh, cook it like a slow cooker or just keep it warm. Either way, it's so rare yeah. that I don't think it was very yeah, successful. I've never seen one. Mm -mm. No. I, I don't know. I've never seen one anywhere else. Uh -uh. So. It's pretty neat. Yeah, this one. Look, an actual wow. picture of it. <laughs> wow. Now that particular uh, tractor, you don't want to ride on the highway in. No way. <laughs> that would chop up the streets. Yeah. It's a 1909 There's a Surrey. something about this that you guys might like. This is a 1909 Studebaker Surrey. Studebaker used to make automobiles up until about 1960 or so. But during the carriage industry, they were the top of the line. If you had a Studebaker carriage, you had the best. And the horse was on this end. And when the horse would be dashing along on the road, be kicking up mud. And more than likely, the people in the Surrey were in their best clothes. They're going to church or something like that. It's not like a farm wagon. Mm -hmm. And so they put something up to stop the mud when the horse is dashing along from getting on the people. So they call this a dashboard. Oh. And that is where the name for the instrument panel on your car comes from. Wow. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> because otherwise, you know, what dashboard, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Now this thing is a piece of soapstone. And soapstone is unique in that uh, it, when you heat it up, it retains its heat for about 12 hours. And so that they use this for, is they heat it up and use it in their beds to warm their feet. Mm -hmm. And they will use it in the surrey, put it on the floor of the surrey, and then have a blanket over their, 
thing. This oh, tells okay. about the little soapstone there. Uh, we get a lot of second and third graders in here on field trips from school and I like to talk to them about the eggs. You know, there are two different kinds of chicken eggs, fertilized eggs and non-fertilized eggs. Mm -hmm. And I ask the kids, how can you tell the difference? Do you know? No, I don't. Okay, they candled the eggs. They actually took a, a candle and shined the light in the egg. Okay. Nowadays, of course, they have electricity. This has a uh, light bulb in it, and you put the, can the egg on there, and mm. the light shines in it. Okay. And if there's a dark spot in the egg, it means it's fertilized. fertilized. No dark spot, it means you give it to the store or whatever. And if you're raising your own chickens, they're going to be free-range chickens probably. Yeah. Then you've got to, you know, you don't know if they've ever been with a rooster or not. Mm -hmm. Right. So you would probably want to candle them. I remember when I was a kid, you'd break an egg open, and every once in a while there'd be a little baby chicken in it. Oh, uh -huh. you know. yeah. Now, with the eggs that they keep, that are fertilized, they put in the incubator and they close it up, and the little heater on there heats it to about 100 degrees, which is about if Mama Hen was sitting on it. And about 20, 21 days, it hatches into little golden chicks. Wow. All right. And here we got the bob wire display. Yeah. Everybody the, has one. Yeah. Ranching is in this area, but we're probably more dairy cattle than beef cattle. Mm -hmm. In fact, Sulphur Springs has a dairy museum. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, but this, I don't know where we got this. People donate things to the museum, you know, and this predates me. But what this always reminds me of is some kid that had a scouting project for a merit badge there. and put together the <laughs> barbed wire collection. It's a mechanical saw, a big put mechanical a, saw. Put a lot of work in that and he would not have been able to have any use of it without donating it to the museum, so good for him. Wow. And then of course timber, this is the Piney Woods part of Texas, so we have timber. How do you like our chainsaw? That's massive. Yeah. Wow. How you gotta be some burly man to be? Uh, yeah, back one. when men were men, they did. <laughs> I don't think I would have stood up for it very long. Yeah. Now one of the interesting things about this particular chainsaw is you couldn't turn the motor because you'd spill the gasoline. Mm -hmm. So what they did was this thing here releases the blade and you turn it, lock it in okay. place, and cut this way, oh. and then cut this way without turning the saw. Oh, yeah. Wow from the 1880s and this part over here is uh, Western Union, okay. the telegraph people. They do not actually belong to the railroad but because the telegraph lines are all under the railroad tracks the ideal place for Western Union is in a train station so they would typically lease space in train stations. And Western Union has outlived many train stations. <laughs> yeah. And these are telegraphers from the railroad. And before they had uh, uh, radios in the trains, if a train was going to pass through Pittsburgh but not stop, and they had a message that the telegraphers got for them, how did they get it to them? They would take that hoop like thing. Uh -huh. And they stand out by the side of the track, and as the train zipped on through, somebody would grab that, take the message off it, and throw the hoop on the side of the ground. So somebody had to hike on down and get it. Uh -huh. So they got smart, and they went to the fork like thing with a piece of string on it, and they'd hold, hold that out there, and they'd grab the string, and nobody had to go pick up string. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. No, you guys, all the traveling and stuff you do, you know who Gene Autry was? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Okay. Gene Autry started out as a telegrapher on the railroad. He was a Texas boy. I don't remember quite where he's from, somewhere more west Texas. But he never worked here in Pittsburgh. But he was working at Chelsea, Oklahoma as a telegrapher. And during the slow times, he'd play his guitar and sing. And one of the passengers heard him and said, hey, you sound pretty good, you know. 
Uh, you have to think about singing professionally. So Gene said, well, I'll try it, and of course the rest is history. Mm -hmm. The guy who told him that was Will Rogers. Wow. Wow. Now I get kids in here, I get people in here actually, that have no idea who Gene Autry is. And uh, I'll tell them, okay, you don't know who Gene Autry is, but you know his music. How about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, mm -hmm. Frosty the Snowman? He, he introduced those songs. Pittsburgh used to have a fair here in Pittsburgh called the Northeast Texas Fair. And uh, because we have two train lines running into Pittsburgh during the fair season, we has met, had as many as eight passenger trains a day come into the fair, wow. bringing people to the fair. So it grew to be the second largest fair in the state of Texas. In 1956, passenger train service stopped in Pittsburgh. And at that point, without the trains bringing visitors in, mm -hmm. okay, again, we ended up with not enough people. It's only found down to 5,000 people. So the uh, fair moved to, I believe, Texarkana. But in 1911, at the fair, they had an airplane. And of course, airplanes were a pretty big deal in 1911. So the people would come just to see it flying around. And at 1911 fair, they had an extra thrill because a guy jumped out of the plane. And that was the first parachute jump in the state of Texas. There's been an awful lot of them since then. And Dr. Milford Jefferson, up there, it was the first African-American woman to graduate from the Harvard School of Medicine. And she did that in 1951, which was still segregation days. So I would imagine that was probably a pretty tough role for her to hold. Oh, yeah. And she was born here in Pittsburgh, but <clears throat> as far as I know, after she graduated from college, she never came back here to live or practice. She practiced medicine on the East Coast. And those, of course, are the Pilgrim Brothers. The one on the uh, right, as you're looking at it, is uh, Aubrey, and he died several years ago, and Bo three years ago or so. Yeah. Hmm. And these three young men here were on the Arizona at Pearl Harbor, and they were all three killed, two sailors and a Marine. And probably the unique thing about that is that Pearl Harbor started World War II. So there were not yet millions of young men in the service. And they have three of them from the little town of Pittsburgh on one ship, particularly two different services, two sailors and a Marine, uh, would probably unique. Yeah. Mike Benet Formals. Oh. Now, Mike Benet did not exist. Uh, a guy by the name of Bigby started the company, and he felt if you're going to do fashion clothes for women, you should probably have a French name. So he named the company Mike Benet Formals. And as far as I know, there was no Mike Benet or Michael Bennett or anything like that. They started in 1957 here in Pittsburgh with three employees, and they grew to 280 employees and they sold gowns all over the world. I like this one the best. Yeah, I pretty. think that's gorgeous. Sure is. That looks like it could be on Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. For sure. The, uh, or they sold a lot of the gowns to people, say like uh, Miss America and Junior Miss America for mm -hmm. the got, uh, formal attire and stuff. And they used to sell gowns to uh, Saudi Arabia, they had this big thing about hoop skirts. Mm. And in order to send the gowns to Saudi Arabia, they had to pack them in refrigerator boxes because oh, of the yeah. hoops. The hoops. Yeah. yeah. I Mis used to play in those. <laughs> Mis Mr. Bigby died, and they tried to hire somebody to run the company. It didn't work out. So they ended up closing their doors uh, in two year 2000. So in 40 some years of business, they grew to be a, a worldwide company. And I think it's kind of unique that we had two companies in the little town of Pittsburgh, uh, Pilgrim's Pride Chicken and Mike Benet Formals, that were big companies throughout the world. 
The year that the Dallas Cowboys won their first Super Bowl, the city of Pittsburgh temporarily changed their name to Cowboys, Texas to honor the Cowboys. And here's a newspaper when they were calling themselves the Cowboys. Well guys, this museum was awesome. And Jim was awesome. And I'm gonna look up, I got his email address so I can get his stories and stuff. He's a history buff too. So you guys, thanks for watching. And uh, put the thumbs up for us and subscribe and, and share with your friends and have a wonderful day. Take it easy, folks. Strange RV tours will take you places with Greg and Janet's smiling faces. You might see a crazy flavored soda review or some tips to fix your RV too. So come along, won't you join us, friend, as we discover what's around the bend. Just sit right back in your easy chair. Strange RV Tours is on the air. Strange RV Tours is on. Hey